Hi, I'm Melanie Davis, and I'm president of the Sterling Heights Regional Chamber of Commerce. And on behalf of our members and our board of directors and our public policy committee, we're grateful for the opportunity to prevent, present this year's City Council Candidate Forum. And at this time, I'd like to introduce our candidates that are with us today. We have Eric Castilla. Thank you. We have Nicholas Cavalli. It's my pleasure to be here. We have Haytham Chola. Thank you. Yes. Jasmine Early. I'm honored to be here. Thank you. We have Sana Elias. Thank you for the invitation. We have Deanna Kosky. Good afternoon. We have Gary Lusk. Good afternoon. Also with us today, we have Michael Radke. It's a pleasure being here. We have with us Maria Schmidt. Thank you, Melanie. We also have with us today Nate Shannon. Thanks for being here. We have Liz Roski. <laughs> Thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah. And we, <laughs> and we also have Barb Ziarko. Thank you for Thank being you. here. Thank you. Thanks for all, all of you to be, for being here with us today. We're also thankful to our media representatives who supplied questions for today's forum. Our questions came from Eric Zarnick at CNG's Sterling Century and local political blogger, Jeff Garapy. The forum for the council, or the council candidate forum this morning will serve as follows. I will serve as moderator, a moderator and I will also be asking the questions that were prepared by our media representatives. Each candidate is going to be given two minutes for a personal introduction. Names will be drawn randomly to determine the order of those introductions. And names will again be drawn to determine the order for responding to each question. We'll draw a name. That person will be the first to respond to that question. And then we will move clockwise from there until all candidates have had an opportunity to answer that question. And then for the next question, I'll draw another name to see who goes first for that question. Two minutes will be allowed to answer each question. The number of questions we ask is going to be determined by the available amount of time we have. And I will also be drawing the questions at random. So we have a large pool of questions that we can ask. I'm gonna be pulling those at random as well. So, um, and that'll be determined again by how much time we have with us today. Following the Q&A, each candidate will be given up to two minutes to give their final statement relating to why they should be elected or reelected. I have over here Jenna Daniel, who is the Chamber's Director of Marketing and Communications for the Chamber. She will be our timer today. When you are close to one and a half minutes, she's going to raise her hand to let you know. And when your two minutes are up, she will then stand. And then you'll be given just a few seconds to finish up your statement. At that point, we'll move on to the next person. We thank the candidates for participating, and we thank our audience members for attending. We ask that both our audience as well as fellow candidates not engage in applause or cheers or jeers or any other unacceptable behavior because our intent today is solely to inform and to educate and to give Sterling Heights citizens an opportunity to just better know all of our candidates and to learn how each one of them would help move our great city of Sterling Heights forward. Due to the number of candidates that we have with us today, we're um, anticipating that this forum is going to last approximately two and a half hours. So it's going to be a long one, but, it, but interesting and good. So thank you. We'll now move forward with our personal introductions and you will have two minutes for this. And I am going to draw a name to see who will be first to introduce themselves. And we are going to start with Maria Schmidt. So Maria. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Maria Schmidt. I've been honored to serve the fine residents of Sterling Heights for the past almost 15 years. I've been a resident and homeowner for the past 23 years, married to my husband, Bob, for 24 years. We have two children, Jordan, a college student, and Natalie, a junior at Sterling Heights High School. 
I currently work as a full-time paraprofessional at the Career Prep Center in the Health Science Department for Warren Consolidated Schools, and I am an active member of the St. Malachy Catholic Church, where I very much enjoy volunteering at their annual summer festival. I'm a current member of the Sterling Heights High School Band, board, uh, band Executive Board and the past co-chair of the Health Advisory Board for the Warren Consolidated Schools. It gives me great pleasure to also volunteer my time to the Children's Tumor Foundation, the regular booster club at Sterling Heights High School, and in the past, St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital, McCrest National Kidney Foundation, and the American Cancer Society. I'm a graduate of Bishop Foley High School and attended Oakland Community College. I'd like to thank the Chamber for this opportunity today. I feel it's a very important um, thing for the residents to really get to know the candidates that they have a choice in selecting at the ballot box in November. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next we'll move on to Liz. Okay, and thank you. My name is Liz Sarowski. I am a resident of Sterling Heights for almost 25 years. I am married to my husband, Steve, Judge Steve Sarowski here in Sterling Heights. We have four boys, Patrick, who is a prosecutor from Macomb County, Anthony, they are twins, and Anthony is a captain in the Marine Corps serving at Paris Island. He is the youngest, I'm going to brag for one second, the youngest ever company commander to be named in the Marine Corps in the entire history of the Marine Corps. So I'm very proud of my son. He is married and we have a granddaughter married to Shawnee and his our granddaughter is Katie Rose. So we're very happy to have finally a girl in the family. Our next son is Steven. He works as an Uber driver right now. And so anytime you need a ride, look for Steve Sorowski Jr. Um, also, he, but he is a graduate of Wayne State University in business. So he has got some good, good bones with that one. My next son is St uh, Aunt Nicholas, go down that list. And Nicholas is 17, still in high school at DLSL High School. I am an active member at St. Lawrence Catholic Community. I have, we have been there for the entire 25 years we've lived here. Very active as a member in the parish council. I have also been a 25 member director of the Vacation Bible School, 25 director of the field day for the school, and also a, a choir and a guitar player choir member and guitar player at the church. So these are some of the activities that we I've done. Also a member of FAN families. Oh, thank you. I have to finish up. So uh, very happy to be in Sterling Heights. I love Sterling Heights. This is where we've had most of our lives here. And I'm so glad to be invited by the chamber to answer some of your questions. Thank you very much. Thanks, Liz. Barb. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, I'm um, Barb Zarkel. I've been serving the residents of the city of Sterling Heights for 16 years. I became a resident of Sterling Heights when I married my husband, Tom, 40 years ago. Um, Tom was a Chrysler retiree, and we were married for 36 and a half years until his death in 2014. I have a daughter, Stacy, who works for the Heat and Warmth Fund, Thaw. I have an associate's degree from Macomb um, Community College, and I've been a member of St. Blaise Catholic Community since 1977. Um, I've been fortunate enough to have worked for the Archdiocese of Detroit through both St. Anne's Parish and School um, as an <coughs> administrative professional um, at the school and at, uh, for 18 years, and then nine years at St. Blaise as a Bible school coordinator, part-time secretary, and bookkeeper. I've served as a vice president of the Regina High School Board of Directors, and I've been an active volunteer through St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, Care of Southeast Michigan, and actively support FAN, Families Against Narcotics. Um, I'm a member of the Friends of the Library, um, the American Polish Century Club Ladies Auxiliary. I'm a graduate of both our police and fire academies and a silent <laughs> member of our CERT team. I was also very active with the American Cancer Society and served on, as chairperson uh, for the first Relay for Life that we had in Sterling Heights in 2005 and continued on that committee until 2010. I also served as president of our Homeowners Association for two years, and last but not least, as a Girl Scout leader. I feel like my personal life uh, reflects that I'm a woman of service and the many volunteer positions that I've held have prepared me to work with many individuals to reach a common goal with cooperation, compromise, and respect. Um, I'm grateful for this opportunity to reintroduce myself to the community and I'm thankful for the Chamber for sponsoring this event. Thank you. Thank you. Nate? Good morning, Melanie, residents of Sterling Heights. We'd like to thank the Sterling Heights Regional Chamber of Commerce and Industry for holding this important event. 
Today's program will provide a great opportunity for residents to hear about the positive uh, direction the, the current city council is moving. There is a stark difference in the approach of government between the current council and the challengers. I think you will find by the end of the program that myself and the current council are the right leaders to continue moving Sterling Heights forward. A little bit about myself, my wife, my wife Lori and I have three kids, Madeline Brody and our third child, Elizabeth. I'm a high school economics, history and government teacher with the Lance Cruz Public School District. My educational background includes a bachelor's, deg bachelor's degree in political science from Oakland University and a master's degree in secondary education from Wayne State University. Two years ago, the city adopted a new slogan signifying our efforts to continue growth in Sterling Heights. Innovating living, innovating living is that slogan and effectively expresses my vision for the future of Sterling Heights. Some of the goals that I've been working to accomplish include keeping our taxes low, allocating new funding to improve our roads, supporting the efforts of the police and fire department, developing partnerships with public and private organizations to establish programs that support seniors' ability to stay in their homes, designing a self-sustaining EMS trans transport service, creating the conditions to encourage business investment, and initiate, initiating a new curbside recycling service that will result in a cost savings to the residents. With the right leadership, Sterling Heights will continue to be a premier city that attracts, and, that attracts and retains residents and business, supports seniors and their ability to remain independent, continues to be one of the safest cities in Michigan, and improves the quality of life for everyone. On November 7th, please vote to re-elect Councilman Nate Shannon. For more information, please find me on Facebook at Nate for City Council. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nate. Okay, we'll move on now to Michael. Hi, folks. My name is Michael Radke, and I'm running for Sterling Heights City Council. As a Sterling Heights resident for 18 years, I spent the early part of my career as a political activist, communications advisor, and small business owner. An avid listener I know the best ideas for improving our community come from the residents themselves. So I've been going door to door, talking with many of you to learn about our community. My father, a disabled Vietnam veteran, taught me the importance of commitment to public service. I'm a proud University of Michigan graduate, and I have graduate degrees from the Columbia University in New York and the London School of Economics. I know how to get things done and stand up for the ideas I believe in. That's why I'm running for Sterling Heights City Council. It's time for new leadership, and my vision for Sterling Heights includes increased, public sa uh, increased resources for public safety, improving our city government and our uh, services to residents, and continue to, to attract new residents and high-tech businesses. If you want to learn more about me or my campaign, please visit voteradkey.com. Thank you. Thank you so much. Deanna? Good afternoon. I would like to thank Melanie Davis and the Chamber of Commerce for hosting the Meet the Candidates Forum for Sterling Heights. My name is Deanna Koski. My husband is Dennis. We have three sons, Dennis, Devin, his wife is Tina, and Derek, his wife is Melissa. We have five grandchildren, and we all live in Sterling Heights. We moved to Sterling Heights in 1969, a year after the city became a city. Over the years, we have had the opportunity to watch the city grow. For the last 27 years, I have had the opportunity to be part of the planning that was required to help make Sterling Heights the best place to work, play, do business, and raise a family. I have an associate degree as a legal assistant, a real estate broker, and a title insurance agent license. I was elected to city council in 1989. As a council person, I wanted to stay informed to be able to serve the residents to the best of my ability. To do this, I completed the MML, that's Michigan Municipal League, Leadership Academy levels one, two, and three. Attended the <coughs> Citizens Police and Fire Academy, the CERT program, and the election poll workers training offered by the city, and I can tell you that was truly an experience. My work experience over the years include working for a savings and loan, as a savings supervisor, mortgage counselor, and closer, <laughs> and I would say that I probably closed a good portion of the homes down in the southwest quadrant of the city because that's what was growing at that time. Real estate broker, closing broker, and title insurance escrow officer. So my business career truly has been closing deals. Currently, I am retired and enjoying being a councilwoman 
and serving the residents of Sterling Heights. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Deanna. We'll now move on to Jasmine. Thank you, residents, for supporting me. Thank you, Chamber of Commerce and Industry, for hosting this forum. And Jasmine Early, I'm blessed to be an American. I'm an architect. I serve on the Citizens Emergency Response Team, the Arts Commission, the Pride and Shine Program, the Math Booster in my son's school, and I assist my husband in his Sunday school and special needs ministry, and a board member for the Right to Life. I'm a leader who has gained the trust and support of our residents. They know that I'm a hardworking, conservative, and committed person, skills that are hard to find nowadays in the political arena. I do not represent special interest groups, and neither do I bow down to political correctness. I represent our taxpayers who care about how their money is being spent. They are tired of elected officials who serve themselves. They work side by side with me on the issues that are most important to, for them, protecting our constitutional rights, public safety, infrastructure, making neighborhood roads a real priority, identifying wasteful spending items, and requesting to eliminate them. We need low tax rates, supporting a small business, and assisting our forgotten seniors and veterans. We have seen how the residents are being neglected, ignored, and mistreated at the council meetings. Our voices are not being heard. Our taxes have been wasted. Our safety is compromised. Our concern has been met with increasing no resolution at the city council meetings. Residents in our city are being intimidated and they either choose to leave the city or stay quiet. They need a strong voice to serve on their behalf. I'm willing to continue being that voice, not just from the podium, but at the council seat. We need to get this done. You and I will drain the local swamp. Say no to the local establishment by voting for me on November 7. Don't let the opposition smear my campaign again. Thank you. I appreciate your support. Thank you so much. And now we'll move on to Nicholas. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, my name is Nicholas Cavalli, and just like everybody else up here, I'm running for Sterling Heights City Council. Um, before I get started, I'd like to extend a couple of thank yous. First of all, to the Sterling Heights Regional Chamber of Commerce and Industry, uh, to Sterling Heights Public Television for putting on this program and airing it at a later date, uh, to my fellow candidates who are up here to discuss the state of our city and the future of our city, along with myself, and to all the residents who are out in the crowd today and are back home watching this when this eventually airs. I'm 20 years old and I'm a 20 year resident of the city of Sterling Heights. I moved here when I was only five months old. Uh, I was educated in Utica Community Schools for my entire scholastic career and I graduated next door at Adlai E. Stevenson High School in 2015. I now attend University of Detroit Mercy as a full time student. I'm a junior pursuing my BA in history and I'm minoring in political science. In, additional, uh, in addition to this, I have some political experience, uh, none as a front runner, but some behind the scenes. I've worked on now three political campaigns in just four short years. Um, the most recent being Mark Schauer's gubernatorial campaign in 2014. But enough about me and enough about my personal background. What's important is how I plan to represent this city. We have one of the most beautifully diverse cities in the entire United States of America. And it's important that we understand that not everyone in this city is going to agree with one another. And it's important that we understand that every single resident in this city has a voice. So regardless of if any of the 11 other people would like to hear your voice and represent it, I will hear you. And if you give me the opportunity come November, I will be that voice for you. Thank you so much for that introduction. We'll swing over here now and to Eric. Great. My name is Eric Castilla, running for city council. But I'd like to start off by saying a couple simple things. Sterling Heights is a vibrant and remarkable city. 15 years ago, I chose to raise my family here with my wife, Lisa. I have a son, Joe, who just graduated from De La Salle and now is at Wayne State University. I have my son, Drake, that attends Adelaide Stevenson High School, who's part of the band. And I'm a band booster parent, and I'm proud of it. When we, I started, I started at 24 years old in Buffalo, New York, as a sewer commissioner. 
my time for public service never ended. Currently, I'm on the Citizens Advisory Council as vice chair for the residents of our city. I'm also on the Brownfield Authority for the businesses of our city. I work as a national director of accounts for Center for Computer Resources, which I'm proud to say a year and a half ago moved to Sterling Heights with 70 employees. Talking about high tech jobs, we have 70 of them right here. We have an office in Petoskey and also Traverse City. I was the national director for the United States for Little Caesars Training Department. I understand what it takes to take complex issues and work them out between the residents and the citizens or the franchisees and the business owners. I don't just say that, I have proof of that. I, I am one of the patent holders of the Manage Your Own program that was one of the toughest business process patents in the United States. And you can look that up. I'm here to work with our council. I don't see a huge difference in with our council. I just feel our voice needs to be heard a little more. Thank you. Thanks so much, Eric. Haytham? Yes, uh, good afternoon. I am Haytham Chola. It's an honor to be here before uh, you beautiful people from Sterling Heights. Uh, I came to United States in 1977. Uh, I became a citizen in 1984. Matter of fact, at Cobo Hall before uh, the late President Ronald Reagan was a president. Uh, I, am, I have been married since uh, 1988 to my beautiful wife, Samira. We have four children, the oldest one. He has a uh, diploma in business, and he do have a business. My second one, uh, she have uh, a doctor degree in pharmacy. My third, my third son just graduated with bachelor degree for accounting, and he's uh, working on his master. My uh, number four, Anthony, he is uh, a senior in uh, Stevenson High School. Uh, that's, uh, I have one grand, one grand baby, and I moved to Sterling Heights in 1990 when my uh, oldest son was only a few months old. I, I lived in Sterling Heights in one house for seven. Then I love the city. I have a few different, a lot of different cities I did not build. I built in, uh, on 19, and I've been there since I am a member of uh, Macomb Sheriff Department as a reserve deputy. I've been there for 15 years, and I love it because we have to get to serve the people. We deliver to the seniors uh, me meals on wheels every year, and I participate in it. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Sana? Good afternoon. I am Sana Elias, a neighbor and a homeowner for the past 25 years. I am so lucky to have the privilege of calling Sterling Heights my home. Like you, I care about and am committed to the betterment of our community. I would be remiss if I didn't first thank many of our residents who helped me get nominated, walked, donated, allowed me to put their signs on their lawn, and prayed for me. You, the residents, are the reason I am running. I wish to ensure that your voice is heard because at times I find our city council is indifferent to your needs. My intent is to bring greater transparency to the City Council by shedding light on issues that need to be brought before you, the people, for discussion. As an elected official, my duty would be to wisely assess the facts and respectfully listen to your concerns to make a decision in the best interest of our community. As a taxpayer, I also feel the economic challenges faced by some of our residents. Because of this, I will work to keep taxes low by eliminating wasteful spending and concentrate on the highest priority needs that are essential to our city services, such as safety, public works, and more local road repairs. I want that. Our, my, my street has not been fixed yet. The current council time fails to realize that some of our neighbors are struggling to make their property taxes. As a member of our community, I hope to bring greater transparency and accountability to bear on this council. During the last election, the large number of donations received by some of our council members from the Mitten Fund and the special inter interest groups should beget the question, what was motivating such large donations? I feel the bidding process for our city's, haul, city's trash hauling contract raised a lot of eyebrows. Now, to qualify for office, those seeking such office should be focused on serving the public competently and with integrity. I have the background and the experience necessary to achieve this. 
I am college educated with a bachelor's degree in economics okay. from the University of Pittsburgh. I'm sorry, I don't want to, your two minutes are up. <laughs> sorry. sorry. That's okay. I talked just, faster earlier. <laughs> we just need to move on. Okay, thank you very much. Gary? Well, hi, my name is Gary Lusk. I think I'm the most fortunate person to sit up here, to be honest with you. I was, uh, I ran years ago against Paul Smith, who I see in the audience, and uh, I lost him by a couple hundred votes, and my political career was over. I had no intention of running for an office again. Uh, the council, I think, looked at the integrity that I had during that race. Uh, when the seat opened up, uh, they asked me if I wanted to to be on council. I accepted, uh, and it's been the best six months I've had. Um, we've heard some negative things about uh, the way our city runs, and it's just not right. When you're running for this office, it's different than having the office. It's different than having the job. When you're here and you have a chance to be able to see how administration works, to see how our fellow council members work and interact with each other, you see we've got the best the city could offer right now. And I'm happy that people continue to run for this office. Uh, they should. They have, everyone has the right to. But don't disparage the people that have the job right now. I, I digress. I apologize. Uh, I have a family. I've got a wife, Diane. I've got three daughters. Uh, two are in California, one right, uh, right now. One is still at uh, Henry Ford. Uh, I've been self-employed for about 20 years uh, as a sales and marketing consultant, and I attacked this position in a very similar fashion. I've attacked every job that I've ever had. So I've got to come in. I've got to hit the ground running. I've got to understand where I can add relevance. So you know, for me, that meant interviewing department heads, interviewing uh, individuals on council, uh, and also the work for the city and trying to understand where I could make a difference. And that's where I'm at right now. I think that I've got a, a lot better uh, game plan than I did six months ago when I was appointed. Uh, I think I've got a lot to offer the, uh, uh, the council. I do a lot of service work. Uh, I'm a fourth degree Knights of Columbus member. I started a Texas Hold'em event for them when our, when our council was struggling. I teach a seventh grade catechism class on Mondays. Um, and I think I'm out of time. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Gary. Thank you, everyone, for those very warm introductions. And now we're going to uh, move on to the questions for the forum. Um, I'm going to draw another name for who will be answering the question first. <coughs> Liz Sarosky, you are going to be first up this time. And we are going to go with the following question. <clears throat> Being attractive to new residents is a feature of any healthy city. How do you feel Sterling Heights stacks up to surrounding cities or townships in terms of both bringing in new residents? And can you give us one idea for a way to improve the city's current efforts to bring in new residents? Okay. Well, being attractive is very important, yes. And some of the things that we are doing and that we need to keep doing are we've improved our ordinances for the current businesses and new businesses that come in to upgrade their properties and to keep their properties up. They can't let their properties go, and they cannot let them, and we have certain guidelines that they have to do for both their uh, landscaping and, and their building maintenance in and of itself. And we make, make sure that those ordinances and those properties are maintained and by those ordinances. But also we need to attract new business and it's healthy to do that. I've, we've spoken to, I personally have spoken to uh, Warren officials, Roseville and East Point officials. Those cities are having, are struggling and keeping new residents coming in. They're actually, their, their populations are declining and part of what they've said to us and it's thanks to the residents who voted for the recreating recreation, that really is making a difference to some of what is happening here in our city immediately and right now. We are bringing in that by itself, is bringing in new vibrance to the city. It's showing that the residents that even, everyone's going to pay a little bit, but that's what that millage was. Everyone the, it voted and passed by the voters' voice, and that millage is allowing those beautiful parks to be rejuvenated and used. Every citizen in the city lives within a mile of a park. That's part of our city plan. And so that makes it wonderful for us to use. What we need to do to continue that is rejuvenate one property that looks like it will be a great property to rejuvenate, and that's Lakeside Mall, and we're working on that and to make that a better and more profitable property for all of us. Thank you. 
Thank you. Barb, do you need me to repeat the question? Yes, please. Being attractive to new residents is a feature of any healthy city. How do you feel Sterling Heights stacks up to surrounding cities or townships in terms of bringing in new residents? And can you give us one idea for a way to improve the city's current efforts? We go out of our way to do a lot of things, to, uh, to many things to attract new residents. Um, I think probably foremost right now is as we're gonna all talk about the last uh, cre recreating recreation is that we felt that taking care of our parks and building a new community center is what would attract younger people to our city. We know that when you're coming here, to, it's a great place to live if you are um, someone that is a senior that needs help. We're there to provide help for those that want to stay in their homes. We're grateful for the nice neighbors who help other neighbors um, so that they, as they age, they can still live um, in, some, in a neighborhood that's familiar with them. But I would think that probably some of the things that we've done are when we start approving different housing developments, that we make sure that they're attractive developments that people are going to want to buy. Um, and some of the developments, they, it, I wanna say that they have different entry levels so that it is affordable for many different incomes. Um, and I'm talking about the uh, probably the new development that we're going to see at the current Maple Lane and on the Mosheri um, company has certainly made it a point to help us bring different people into um, the city. So that's just one of the examples. Um, I think the other thing is besides just um, the financial part of it, well, if you were to compare the services that you receive in Sterling Heights, you, everybody will say that you get more bang for your buck in Sterling Heights. And that means that your garbage picks, picked up, you don't have to pay separate for that. Um, you do have a voluntary recycling program. Um, our water rates are the lowest in, um, uh, in cities of over 25,000 people. So we certainly want people to come here because it's economical to live here as well as having the amenities for a good life. Thank you so much. Okay, we'll move on to Nate. Do you need me to repeat no, the question? Th thank you, Melanie. Uh, first of all, I'll, I'll say that uh, in Southeast Michigan, Sterling Heights uh, is second to none to any community, I would say, uh, especially for families, new families that want to move in and re uh, retaining the families that we already have, already have here. Um, there are, there's a list of things that, um, that I'm going to go over that are things that fa young families are looking for when they're trying to decide where they want to move. Uh, first of all, we have uh, school, great schools, two, two great school districts uh, being the Utica Community Schools and Warren Consolidated Schools. Those are top-notch schools that are attracting families. They're looking for good schools and they, and they, and they have them right here in Sterling Heights. Uh, affordable housing, we have affordable housing that's, that's, that's available to people, uh, for, especially for young families that are you know, first moving into uh, their first home. Public safety, we just got statistics from, uh, from the FBI ranking us as the safest state uh, among pop, um, with population over 100,000 uh, in, in the state of Michigan and we're in the bottom 10% of the state of the country actually. So <laughs> public safety is definitely a top priority for anyone, uh, including new, new residents that want to move into the city. We have great services, um, including the new recycling program that just was put into place a couple months ago where we have a, a, a low cost for recycling um, and it's now on a weekly basis, and I think that that's a, that's a, a definite win. Um, adding transport, that, that adds another level to public safety. I think that that's, uh, you know, residents knowing that if there's an emergency, it's going to be taken care of in a, in a, quick, in a, in a quick and efficient way. Um, I think that that's going to be another selling point to this city. But the one area that I want to talk about that we were lacking in, uh, and it's not that we were lacking in the amount of parks, we were lacking in the, uh, the upkeep of our current parks. The, the, the curb parks all needed a, a makeover, and that's gonna take place. We have all kinds of things that are going to be happening, including a uh, 120,000 square foot rec center across the street, a splash pad, uh, a ice skating rink, a new pavilion for the farmer's market, and all the neighborhood parks are going to be spruced up with new equipment uh, made to look beautiful. And it, it, after those, all those th uh, amenities are taken care of, that's going to be a definite attractor uh, to new residents. So thank you. Excellent, thank you so much. Could you repeat the question? Absolutely. Being attractive to new residents is a feature of any healthy city. How do you feel Sterling Heights stacks up to surrounding cities or townships in terms of bringing in new residents? And can you give us one idea for a way to improve the city's current efforts? Well, I love Sterling Heights. I moved back here from uh, United Kingdom in London because my family was here and my friends were here and I grew up here. I think the three things that make Sterling Heights Sterling Heights are excellent public schools, uh, great public safety, including police and fire, and a clean, beautiful community. 
I think these are the three things we need to focus on. These should be the city's priorities. Now, we, don't, we are not a school board. We can't cover schools. But we can make sure that our blight enforcement is top notch. That we're making sure our community stays clean. We can make sure that the police are fully funded. And you know, sadly, I think we've laid off 24 officers over the last 15 years. That's not a good plan for public safety in Sterling Heights. Mm -hmm. If I'm elected, I want to make sure we're giving our police officers what they need to keep our community safe. On top of that, I think that we've, you know, our code enforcement officers now are part-timers. And it shows. You know, I'm, I live in an older community. I live at 15 Mile in Van Dyke. And I think my community is beautiful. But there's always that one person who sticks out like a sore thumb because they don't keep the community up. We have to make sure we're giving them the proper encouragement to be good neighbors and maintain their property. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Deanna? Thank you. There is no comparison Sterling Heights to any other city. You can ask any real estate broker if you put a Sterling Heights property on the market, it's gone within three days. I can attest to that. Sterling Heights is a wonderful community. We serve all. We have different things for different people. For our seniors, we have our Senior Citizen Center, which I know that they enjoy very, very much. We are working on providing uh, recreation for our youth. That's recreating recreation. We're improving our parks. We're going to have our splash pad. We've, uh, we're making improvements to tennis courts. We've got baseball diamonds. We're trying to provide recreational uh, facilities for the youth so that they want to stay here in Sterling Heights. Looking forward to the children of tomorrow and how we can help them. We have jobs. We have manufacturing. We're looking to create a climate for businesses so that when they come here, they stay here. Good paying jobs, which of course creates a trickle down effect. So everyone <coughs> benefits from that. Sterling Heights uh, is very open. We talk to our residents. We hold forums to find out what kind of vision they want. That's why the Vision 2030 was created, so that we know what kind of city they want to be in in 2030. And that's what we're working towards. Excellent. Thank you so much. Jasmine? <coughs> When we moved here, we did it because the taxes were low. That was back in 2004. We believe, we thought that they will stay low. In the last few years, the taxes has been raised three times. We can encourage people to come to our city if we keep raising the taxes, even though it's said that we are one of the lowest taxes raised in the city. Something that I notice when we walk is if you walk east of Van Dyke, people are moving out. And there is a reason why they are moving out. We need to encourage the people to stay. It's not just to come here, but to stay here. The, the situation, what I will do, encourage the local businesses. We see south of 15 Mile, I call it the forgotten area. There is little done in that area, in the east side of Van Dyke. We need to encourage those areas so people who live there stay there. Encourage the local businesses. We give, we give tax abatements to the big companies. But what are we doing with the local businesses that are here? We need to encourage and motivate them to stay. Is there a solution for them? Can the state or the city level create a discount, with no investment for them, for them to stay here so they can hire local people, so people can stay here. We had a situation, it's real, it's happening. We need to face it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, we'll move on to you now, Nicholas. Uh, thank you. Uh, and I think this is a really important question. As I mentioned in my introduction, Sterling Heights is one of the most beautiful cities and it is one of the most diverse cities, both in the state and in the country. Uh, one of the things that makes our city so attractive, as I believe Mike mentioned, was the uh, fire and police forces that we have here. Our emergency services are amongst the best in the entire state. And in the case of our police force and fire, for, uh, fire department, we're up there in the nation as well. Um, 
I would like to point out that uh, we are down five patrol officers in addition to the 19 officers who were working in the office positions. And I would also be happy to work towards bringing at least the patrol force of the city of Sterling Heights up to whole. Uh, in addition to this, I think we need to make the community a little bit more, as I like to call it, resident friendly. We need to review some old ordinances that have been in place since the 1970s, since before I was born, frankly, um, and update them to the technology and times that we have today. We have to understand that things have changed since 1970, and with that, so should our community. In addition to this, we need to update, upkeep, and preserve our city's many gems, of which I consider Lakeside Mall, the, parks at, uh, the trails at Dodge Park, and the Clinton River. But the number one thing that can help attract citizens to the city of Sterling Heights is affordable housing. We see housing developments all the time come before the city council, and when they do, they ask for a unit price, and the lowest I've heard is $285,000 for a unit. That is outrageous. Some people just don't have the money to afford housing that expensive. We need to make it so that anyone can live in our city, not just the people who can afford it. Excellent. Thank you. Eric? Great. Um, after listening to some of the council members, again, I believe Stillings is a vibrant and remarkable city. Um, the number one, the Census Bureau in 2014 did a report, and the number one reason people want to move to a city is jobs, period, jobs. They want jobs. We have more engineering jobs in Stillings Heights than any other city our size in the country. High paying jobs. We also, the median income, the house value in our city is only $188,000. It's not $250,000, it's $188,000. So our housing is very affordable. It went up 7.1% last year and it's expected to go up 3.1% in 2018. What we need to do as a city, we have great parks. We need to market them. We need to take care of our homes. As I'm walking doors and knocking doors every day, I'm seeing issues with blight. Blight was brought up and there's a problem. Our residents don't understand that there are programs that our city has to help them fix and repair their homes. We have a program with a no interest loan. Well, it's an interest deferred loan to help people repair their homes. I brought those to senior residents. They need to know what we have to help them. We have small repair loans through our city. That's how we keep a city, keep, take care of our elderly, take care of our young families coming in, positive with our schools, get out there and work and volunteer, and make sure the jobs stay here. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Hey, Tom. Uh, well, as I said, I lived in a city for 27 years. Uh, the city is almost, I could say, 100% beautiful. Almost everybody, they keep in their house up. But there is a few people which do not maintain their houses. And by our luck, those houses, it's right on the main streets when somebody drive by. So if that person cannot fix their home or they do not have the time. As Eric said, we do have a program. They can get loan, pay somebody else to do it. Or maybe we can ask the city for volunteer, especially if it's a senior citizen. They cannot get on the ladder and paint their houses or repair it. And maybe they do not have the income to be able to pay somebody. This is one of them. Maybe we can help in that way. And also, for our city to track new businesses. The problem is they come in and they lease a building for five years and when the tax break run out, they fold it up and they go. I believe we should, anybody who lease a building, not build it themselves, we should give them break or give them tax them first year, second year they have to pay. Third one, again, they have to pay and fourth skip. That's how you at least guarantee the jobs will stay in the city and that manufacturer or businesses stays in the city. And also, we have to check on the background of all them contractor who, who repair or replace the street. My street just got replaced five months ago, and it's already deteriorating, and big chunks comes in out of it. This is not, you know, this is not good for the city and the resident of the city because that who paid the bill for every street get replaced. Then thank you. Thank you so much. Hey, Sana? Yes, I've, I've lived in this city 25 years and I do love it. 
I love the fact that it is middle class. It's moving away from that. But the median income for families here is 60000 That means people, half the people make more than 60000 the other half make less. So we need to be aware of that. There are people out there that are going to have difficulties if our taxes <coughs> keep going up. So I definitely want to maintain that our taxes remain low. And we have, before the parks and recreation millage increase, we had the same number of parks. They, uh, they just needed upkeep that were great opportunities for people to visit, have picnics, uh, and just enjoy the scenery there. So we have 25 parks uh, that are available. We also improved, I think it was last year, that they improved the, um, the corridor or the uh, Clinton River. Uh, restoration so that's a great place to be too we have great amenities our Sterling Fest one of the best in the in the area our music in the parks that we offer to our residents free of charge the farmers market uh, and the great parks that I mentioned all of these are free amenities that are available to the residents uh, I believe birding the parks and recreation millage should have been phased in rather than creating a 20-year millage because within that park there are some programs that are not beneficial or necessary. What I wanted to do is let the people decide rather than, am I done? <laughs> oh, okay. Rather than introduce it as a millage increase lasting 20 years and burdening those uh, communities and those families who cannot afford it, phase it in. Let, uh, let the people decide what is most important, phase it in over time as needed because we really have to be aware of that. Also, too, good communication with our homeowners so they know what's available, like you said. There's a lot of services here that are available. There's the Pride and Shine that can also help elderly people who cannot maintain their home. But communication from the city to the residents is imperative. All right. Thank you so much. Gary? Uh, Deanna referenced something that I actually went on the internet just to make sure that I worded it properly, talking about our 2030 visioning statement. And a couple of the guiding principles there are safe, well-maintained, and desirable neighborhoods, enhancing great schools, uh, plentiful leisure and recreation activities, abundant pathways for biking and hiking. And these things were well thought out. So I don't think that we have to make a lot of changes. I think we have to stay the course. I think the city and the city administration, the current council, uh, sees where the future of the city needs to be. I think we've had good organic growth. I think, uh, I think the number I saw was 2.6%. Uh, we're, we're going to be the number third largest city uh, in Michigan uh, with the next census. And that doesn't happen by accident. It happens because we've, we're planning for success. Recreating recreation, we've got, we've got smart voters in the city, right? We've got people who understand that even with an aging population, we need to bring in bright, young, vibrant families. And we have to give them something to do when they're here. So one, have a good job. 60, 5,000 jobs in the city. Um, education, great areas to be able to get educated. We have a good school system here. But I think we really have to stay the course. I think we're doing, as an administration, as a city, what we need to do. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, Maria? I'm going to ask you to repeat the question. Sure. <laughs> Not a problem. Not a problem. <laughs> Being attractive to new residents is a feature of any healthy city. How do you feel Sterling Heights stacks up to surrounding cities or townships in terms of bringing in new residents? And can you give us one idea for a way to improve the city's current efforts? Well, first of all, I think that our numbers speak for themselves. Where other communities are seeing a decrease in their population, we are seeing an increase in population. Um, that, the reason being, I think, um, you know, recreating recreation, of course, is a work in progress. And, and we're all excited about the new things that, that we have coming down the pike with that. Um, we have a second to none public safety, public works department, uh, fire department. Um, they are known nationally for what they do here in the city. We're the, one of the safest cities in the country. That's why people want to be here. We have great school districts. We also have tools in our toolbox to help us vigorously um, go after blight and pre prevent blight. And we're in the process of um, addressing some very um, blighted situations that have gone on way too long. Um, I think we have become known throughout as a business-friendly environment. Business-friendly brings jobs, jobs brings family. 
Um, and the more that we're all out there, we embrace our diversity in this, in this city. We want to learn about each other. We want to tolerate each other. And I think that's why people want to be here. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think everybody's had an opportunity to answer that question. So we'll move on to the next one. I'm going to draw another, draw another name here. So Jasmine Early, you get to answer first for this particular question. And we are going to go with the following question. In a little over half a year, one third of the council had to be replaced. One person was elected to a higher office. The other moved out of the area. Do you feel the remaining council members and mayor should select the person to fill the void based on credentials and vetting, or should the vacancy be filled by the next highest vote getter from the most recent election? I'm assuming that you are talking about what happened with the two council members that were appointed, yes. Liz and Lusk. Well, I feel, and so do many residents in our city, and I had to go back to the comment that Mr. Lusk just made, that he never wanted to run for office, to take that office. Well, it is interesting that for somebody who did not want to be in office was appointed. We ran for office. There were three people who had, the, in the previous election, who had votes that made them qualify by the residents, because they voted for them, to take the position. Why the, the, the person was chosen, the only reason was because he was a friend. Whether he had qualifications or not, the voters, the previous election said, I want that person. No, enough people voted for him to be sitting in the council, but enough people to be the reason why the mayor and the city council members should have chosen the person that was in line with, uh, according to the amount of votes. If that person did not apply for the position, then the next one. If that person didn't, then the next one. That was my case. Two eyes. That case was denied to me. I don't think it was fair. I think I was pretty qualified to take the position. And um, it was not fair. It was not professional. And just to say that he didn't want the position, that makes this whole situation more upsetting and unfair. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Nicholas, do you need me to repeat the question? No, thank you, Melanie. Um, I'm actually going to keep this rather short and sweet. Um, I'm perfectly OK with the way that our city charter works today. But I do have one small issue. Um, I don't know if this is just something that comes to me, but the people who receive the next amount of votes should logically be the next candidate for that position, regardless of if it's selected by the council and the mayor or if it's selected by the original vote. Those people should be the highest candidates, not people who didn't even run. And that's no disrespect to either of you guys. You know, I love you both. So. <laughs> Thank you so much for your answer. Okay, we're going to swing around here. Eric? Well, I support our charter and how the charter is written. And if I become on city council, I have to look at that and talk to the other council members and see what is best. You know, there's a lot of situations. And it was a perfect situation when someone left. There was nothing going on. There was no emergency. But the council has to have the ability to appoint someone that they see as fit in a situation that might not be there. Now, I do believe that the people that had the vote and did run, they deserve consideration, high consideration, because they took the effort out of their time to run for city council, and they should have been considered and not slighted in any way. That's all I have to say. Excellent. Thank you. Hey, Tom? Uh, yes. Well, I'm not sure what the law or uh, there is regulation how the any member could be appointed to the city council with all due respect to all of you guys uh, if there is a different law than uh, you know prevent the mayor from you know appointing a new council then we have to pick the person who is more qualified 
or bring that person to meet with this with the city with the council and see if that person is qualified or not but if there is no law or regulation uh, you know prevent them from doing so so it's up to the mayor and uh, the city council to appoint another person but i prefer to be the person who got you know the most vote after the six one thank you thank you sana um i definitely believe we have to be consistent in our practices when there was a void uh, Nate Shannon was selected because he had the highest vote getting. Mm -hmm. So we assumed the next two vacancies would be in that order. That wasn't the case. And this reminds me, if they don't want you there, they will change the rules. That is wrong. Because those people made it extra effort. To get nominated requires close to a thousand <clears throat> signatures. That's a lot of walking and going out to meet the neighbors. Two. It requires a lot of work. I've been walking for the last five months. I've been, prior to that, to get nominated another two or three. I've been putting the effort in. I've been studying the issues. I've been coming to the council. The people who were appointed were not doing that. That's not fair because the others are showing effort. They're committed to do the work and they are represented by the voice of the people. The people did actually vote for them. Uh, this eliminates favoritism. And it only it should reward the person who works the hardest and made the effort to represent and be active in the council. The others were not active, were just chose as favorites because they could work with them. I'm not here to, I could work with anybody, but I'm here to work for you, the residents. And I think they forget that. Mm -hmm. Those people who, who ran, put a, committed a lot of time, effort, and their own money to win, to, to uh, run so it's extremely important that we should give them that consideration rather than bypass them in favor of someone who is a friend that is wrong that's not the best interest of our community that's not the best interest for the voters and it's not the best interest for ethical reasons all right thank you so much okay Gary? Obviously, I couldn't disagree more. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll go back to time. So you, you made a valid point, and, and I'm talking to you, I apologize. You made That's a valid okay. point that you, the person who sits in this position has to earn that, right? So I think that I did. When I ran five years ago, five and a half years ago, I walked and I spoke to people for a year and a half. I worked extremely hard. Uh, I learned a lot during that time, and I lost. So when I say that I was done with politics, I was tired. Uh, Liz here, who's going to be speaking soon, is, you know, she just ran for county commissioner and, you know, she's running for city council right now. The amount of work that everyone up here knows that's involved in trying to have this job is incredible. But what we're not talking about is it's a service job. This is about service. This is about commitment to your city. And it's not about me. It's not about anybody else on this council. It's about us working together. So when the council looked at Liz, they thought, well, who can, I'm speaking for you, I apologize. They're thinking, who could, okay. who's, let's look at someone who's been committed to the city, who has put the work in to run for an office, didn't win the office, but we know that they're committed. We know that they've got good service aspects to them. We feel we could work with them. That's how they looked at me as well. You know, I think that I've proven myself in the last six months that I've worked tirelessly with full-time job and family to make sure I understand this job as well as I can because I'm not a political junkie, because I'm not someone who spends all their time trying to understand local politics. But now that I have it, I owe the residents the best work that I can possibly do. So uh, I'm glad this question came up. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, Maria. Thank you. Um, Actually, I'm going to back up the truck even farther to 2003 when I was appointed. I did not really know anybody that sat up on this council. I sat in the audience for two years. I never ran for an election. And here I sit almost 15 years later. I have earned my stripes sitting up here. I um, am comfortable with our charter and how um, it advises us to replace members of council. Um, and as far as Mr. Shannon being appointed because he was the next highest vote getter, that wasn't the case for me. I'm not sure if that was publicly stated that that was the reason why all of council appointed Mr. Shannon, but that wasn't the case for why I voted for him to be appointed to council. So um, 
I'm, I'm perfectly comfortable with it. Sometimes there isn't a whole lot of time um, depending on when that vacancy occurs. And um, I, I think I'm very comfortable with how it went. Thank you. Thank you. Liz? Okay, well, as, as uh, with Gary, I do believe that, and most of the people who have spoken truly, we need to support, and I support the charter and the charter process. The charter process allows for the council to appoint for uh, vacancies. So I am not for someone who may have gotten a highest vote getting count, and that could have been, regardless of when this new person needs to be appointed, that could have been conceivably two years or at least a good year and a half Previous there will be new candidates within that time that may be interested in running you cannot just vote somebody In my opinion that may have had a higher vote get highest vote getting account way back when two years ago or maybe a year that doesn't make sense that you, there are opportunities for other people you don't know who's coming now for myself I did run for county commissioner against the gentleman who I replaced, Joe Romano, as many of you do know. I lost to him by 0.001%. 15 votes of a 30,000 vote count between Joe and I, 15 votes. So to say that I have not done the work, ludicrous. To say that I have not walked, my shoes can tell the story. My children walked, my, my family walked, my friends walked. We, I know the citizens of the city and have, this is my second campaign in two years, so have done the work. I do believe that the, this, you never know what candidate may come out of that woodwork and be a good candidate. That's why appointments do have value. And so I do think that there are reasons for good appointments. Thank you. Thanks so much. Barb? As a sitting member of council, I would follow the charter, and the charter is very explicit in what we do when there's a vacancy. And the council has 60 days from the time the vacancy occurs to make a decision. If we can't make a decision within the 60 days, we go to a special election. Every council I think that would sit here would not want to go to a special election because it costs money. And in this case, uh, you have to look at it as an appointment. It's only an appointment to the next election. Mm -hmm. We are not appointing this person for, without going through the work of another election when the, when the current term expires. But I would say that um, it would be like applying for any other job. Um, I remember when we had all of the candidates come here and give us their background, the next thing would be is if you were applying for a job, wouldn't you go to references? Wouldn't you go and look to see where this person has been before? What were they active in before? What did, uh, how did they help another person before? Did they help another uh, elect, or were they elected to another office in another uh, community? Those are things that you look for in their background. I can give you two examples, and we'll use the ones that, we, Mrs. Schmidt and I had never really known each other until she got the appointment to be on council. It worked, we'd become friends now and colleagues, it worked. Um, actually, I was at Mr. Lusk five years ago when he ran. After he um, lost the election, he still stayed in contact with former Mayor Nadi, met with him once a month to share his ideas and was respected by the former mayor. Mrs. Sorowski pretty much laid it on the line is she received a number of votes from um, uh, and just barely lost to Mr. Romano. Mr. Shannon, the reason why he was appointed wasn't because he got the next it just happened that he got the next highest vote. That wasn't the only reason. It's just like any other job, you gotta look at what people are bringing to the table and you look at their references. That's it, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, Nate. Thank you, uh, I'll be brief. I think we can get to question, uh, another question that residents are really concerned with. Uh, but I'm comfortable with, uh, with the procedure of, appoint, uh, of appointments to the city council when there's a vacancy. Um, uh, Mrs. Jarko uh, did allude to what I was going to say about what Joe Romano said uh, when I was appointed. I was, he basically said to, something to the effect of, I'm here for 11 months, and in November, the, if you've earned the trust of the voters, you'll be elected or you will not be elected. And so it's a temporary, it's a temporary position, and there's a lot of work that has to go into that person be, to become elected uh, once the next, the next election comes up. So that's all I have to say on the issue, uh, and so I'll yield my time. Thank you so much, Nate. Okay, Michael? Yes, 
I believe we need to follow the charter, and I'm for an appointment depending on qualifications. What I'm not for is just an arbitrary process. And I think that the first appointment this year went through that. People were asked to submit resumes to the council. They were asked to come and speak. They had a chance to explain themselves. And the council appointed someone that they, they agreed with, I guess, with their ideas. Second time, we, didn't go, we did not go through that. They made the deal in a back room, and they appointed someone. I don't think that's the way to run a democracy. I think it's the way to run a government. So I disagree with the second appointment and not the first, simply because I think that if we have a process, we should follow the same process every time. Excellent. Thank you. Deanna? Thank you. <clears throat> we have gone through appointments over the years a number of times. You never know when a council person is going to have to leave. The charter uh, dictates how this is done. It has worked in the past, and I think it's an excellent idea. If council cannot come to an agreement, we can always go to a special election and spend $60,000, but I don't think that council really wants to do that. We opened it to the public. The uh, reason that we didn't open it for the last appointment was because it was so close. We had already gotten appointments, and we had gotten a book that was oh, very thick. So we figured that we had all the candidates that were interested already available. Being on council, I have learned that it is good to have a variety of professions or backgrounds on council because we each bring our own unique talent to this table. I can tell you over the years I found and met some very, very interesting people. I don't want to sit here with six attorneys. I can guarantee you that. <laughs> I don't want to sit here with six attorneys. I can guarantee you that. I think it is great the way we have been doing it. We look at the candidates and we say, OK, this one's a doctor, this one's a lawyer, this one's an Indian chief, this is a baker, this is a butcher. So we have one of each kind. And that's what we try to do. And I think the system works very, very well, and I hope with this new election, we all stay. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, we're going to move on to the next question now, so I will draw another name. Gary Lusk, you get to, you get to be first off this time. I can't prep, huh? <laughs> <laughs> The election is over. You've just been sworn in and you want to see your initiatives move forward. How will you approach working with your fellow council members to build consensus? You have to earn the right. You have to earn the respect. And it goes back to um, what I've been speaking to on the last couple of times I've had a chance uh, at the mic is I had to prove to them that one, I deserve the job. I thank them for for bringing me in. Uh, Deanna mentioned that they look for specific traits. I met some of those traits, so now I've got to earn it. So immediately I started going department by department, taking copious notes, making sure I have an understanding of what that department does, what its challenges are, um, then going to finance and finding out what, can, what we can afford. And what I found is oftentimes at a department level, they'll have a list this long of things that they want, and the money is enough to f fund about half of that, right? So nothing gets spent, nothing gets done in the city unless you really have to fight for it because we value two things. We value low taxes. Uh, and, and to have low taxes, it means we have to have a very lean form of government. Um, I think that if I'm going to stay on council, I hope that I do in November, I hope, I hope that I'm elected as opposed to appointed, uh, I think that I'm gonna make some differences. I've had several conversations with uh, with administration about ideas that I think that are good that I've vetted. I've got one I'm working on right now with solar energy that I want to be able to, to earn the right to be able to present. Uh, that's not going to be an issue with me coming up with good ideas that I think are going to be relevant to the city. Um, getting funding for those, making sure that they make sense is, is going to be a challenge. And also getting the rest of the council to look at it because I'm one vote. It's not I, again, it's we. And one person can't make a difference on this council. People have tried that before. Uh, it has to be a collective thing. So that protects the residents of our city to make sure that we agree that it's the right path for the city to go into. Thank you. Thank you so much. Maria? 
Uh, thank you. I think some of the most important qualities about sitting up here on City Council is the ability to communicate and to work with people that you don't necessarily agree with some of the time or most of the time. But you learn, you learn about each other and you learn that as much as you thought you were different from them, you're pretty much more alike than you realize. Um, I think uh, open-mindedness and respect, mutual respect, that's how you get things done. That's how you get people to understand your vision and get them on board with your vision. Um, I think, you know, this council has come together in um, some horrific times. Uh, the past councils, the, the loss of our mayor and us dealing with that. Um, the, you know, the loss of two council members that for whatever, you know, for their various reasons have left. We've all come together um, and learned to work as a team. And I think that's really what's important is you can't have such tunnel vision. You have to be able to just listen to each other sometimes and not talk. Thank you. Liz? Well, as Gary alluded to, there is no I in team, and we do, as council people, have to work together as a team. You cannot come with your own agenda. You cannot come with special or personal interests. You do represent the people of the city. So you need to listen to your city members and then bring your representation to the council and work with that council. As, as um, some have said, you need to help mold sometimes if you do have ideas that you really think might be a good idea to try to get across. We work together. We try to, we work with city, we need to work with the city administration and that is not usually a problem. We have a great administrative team here and they are, they do work at the behest of council so we are all, it's a synergistic relationship that we work together in order to get the best that we can for this city. And so coordination, working as a team, communication are the things that work and being patient with each other. We cannot jump the gun and we have to learn to be working together. So that's how we do it. Thank you. Thanks so much. Barb? I used to have, when I worked at St. Anne's, I would have this little quote under my blogger and I made sure that my boss always saw it and it said, if you want to prove how smart you are, you'll hire people that are smarter than you. And so, I mean, it was, it was something that I thought about and that's what this council certainly has done is we surround ourselves with the best of the best as far as giving us advice. Uh, but I don't sit here because this is what Barb Zarko wants to do because it could be that what Barb Zarko wants to do isn't in the best interest of what Sterling Heights should be. So it isn't about what I want. It really is about the, what the residents want. And we get to, we can't get to everything all the time or in the time frame um, that they want us to, but we certainly work on it. We um, answer their questions. Uh, we make sure that, that somebody from administration uh, reaches out to them so that they might have a solution to their problem. But w certainly we listen to uh, residents. Um, and you know what, I, I listen to, well, you know, when I'm here, I want to promote uh, more police officers. Oh, there isn't a person up here that wouldn't want to see 40 police officers, you know, and we're going to hire them. Where's the money coming from? So these are things that you have to ask yourself. There's a lot of things that people want, but how are you going to pay for it? So those are things that you, you have to make decisions on. You put things in a, a, a priority list as to what we're going to do. We are very, very, very fortunate that the residents of this community have been a part of the solution that we were faced with eight year, or almost 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. I remember that we were projecting that we would not be coming out of the economic crisis for 10 years. We're at nine years and we're making it. But the residents have been a part of that solution. If it wasn't for them passing the millages that they did, we wouldn't be where we're at today. So it isn't just about the council, it's about the residents and they have come through too. Thanks so much. Nate? Oh, can I actually ask you to uh, repeat the question, sure. please? Absolutely. Thank you. The election is over and you've just been sworn in and you want to see your initiatives move forward. How will you approach working with your fellow council members to build consensus? 
Uh, okay, uh, so thank you. Uh, I, first of all, I would say that uh, whatever initiative that you're going to try to present to the other council members, you better be, you better know the issues. Uh, you, you need to be knowledgeable about your argument and how you're presenting it to them. Uh, and you do that by building relationships with uh, administration and department heads and get their expert guidance. Uh, I think that once you've done that, you start to communicate your vision to other council members uh, to try to get them on board. Uh, and you show respect during that whole process. Uh, you, and then essentially, I think uh, uh, one of the main issues that you need to do is you need to prove that whatever issue you're trying to promote is, what's, is what is in the best interest of the residents. Because if you can't prove that, and, you're not, and somebody's trying to come to me and try to prove something that they, that they want uh, to get pushed through, and they're not showing me that it's going to benefit the residents in some way, it's not going to happen. So I think that's the best way to approach you know, dealing with other council members. And I think that we've done that very successfully over the last, you know, I've been on, on here uh, on city council for two and a half years now. I think we've done a great job at making, you know, making our arguments to the, rest of the, to the rest of the council members and being successful. So that's all I have, thank you. Excellent, thank you. Moving on to Michael. Can I ask you to repeat the question again? Sure. The election is over and you've just been sworn in. You want to see your initiatives move forward. How will you approach working with your fellow council members to build consensus? I think when working with fellow council members, the number one idea should be mutual respect. We've all been elected by the voters. We've all been chosen to make do this job. The question is, though, is that we don't always agree on all the ideas that we have. I think my first job as a council member would be to listen to the residents and just listen before I speak, because I learn more by listening to what other people have to say than I ever have just shouting off my own ideas. Once we get that, we would start focusing on our priorities. What matters the most and how are we going to pay for it? I agree with Barb. Priorities are important. I like parks, but I love cops. I think that that's the most important issue that we have to face. I think at that point, you have to really identify the issue you want to target and create a, a movement for it. It's not just about us or the council. It's about what the residents want and are they going to support it. The park mode was supported by the residents because enough people thought it was a great idea. It wasn't just because the council thought it was a great idea. It's because the residents thought it was a great idea. I think that's the most important thing. Excellent. Thank you so much. Deanna? Thank you. Just sworn in, you have great ideas, creative ideas, things that you want to do, the goals that you have for the residents of Sterling Heights. How do you get this through your fellow council members? New ones that maybe you don't even know. Well, you want to share your ideas with them. You want to share your dreams, your goals. This is what will be good for the people of Sterling Heights. And this is how I think we should do it. You have to do it respectfully. You have to do it professionally, and you have to understand that you're going to agree to disagree. I want that third dog on the canine <laughs> No, Kelsey, you can't have it. So next budget, we'll try again. But when you cannot get the support that you need, you have to learn to leave it at the table. Don't carry it with you. There's going to be other ideas. There's going to be other things that you want to get through. You have to develop this respect for each other. You have to do it professionally. I've been on councils that, I'm sorry to say, I have labeled do nothing council, simply because we could not agree on anything. We fought each other constantly. I don't want that. It doesn't work. We never move forward. I want to see the city continue to move forward. So I say, after election, respect each other, be professional, share your ideas, make sure that your goals are the goals that are going to benefit the residents of Sterling Heights. Thank you very much. Jasmine? For the last few years, I have been involved in commissions in our city, and we have worked well. Um, I do have the teamwork skills and I had proven by staying there for many years. For me, this will be just a transition between the commissions and a city council seat. I do believe that we need respect, respect not just here in the council seat, <coughs> but out there at the city hall, at the lobby, at the parking lot, at the community. We need respect for the residents and that is what I will encourage the council to do. We are representing them and we are their voice. We need to be that um, line that communicate with them and that communication starts here at home at the council seat. Thank you. Thank you so much. Nicholas? 
Um, so I'm going to preface this with a little bit of a shocker of a statement. I don't entirely agree with everything everybody up here has to say. I know that's a shocker. But I like to think of myself as 100% a team player. I've been involved in teams and organizations basically my entire life, and I've not always agreed with my team members. But that does not stop me from moving forward and working with them. Um, I look to prove to everyone from city administration to my fellow council members, if I do get elected, to the residents of Sterling Heights that this isn't just some election time show that some kid is running. I like to prove and earn the trust of everybody. Um, I would really look forward to working with my fellow representatives, my fellow council members, on developing studies for new ideas and work with the residents on developing these ideas. I think it's a resounding yes from up here that the residents are the most important part of this process. Um, and I would like to make sure that everything that is a goal to me comes first on behalf of the residents. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Eric? Thank you. Um, if I have the honor or privilege to be elected and sit on city council, um, all my past experience, I've been on boards, commissions, projects. You have to work with respect. You have to lead. You have to work hard and prove yourself to your fellow candidates or fellow members. Um, humility goes a long way. And sometimes I think we lose that face of humility. When we're talking to residents that are upset about an issue, we have to listen to their voice. I can tell you this, every issue that comes up in front of me will always have three things that it has to pass. Is this sustainable? Is it affordable? And is it in the best interest of our community? We need to work together and attacking each other won't work, attacking our residents won't work. We need to be, not come from a place of arrogance, but a place from understanding. So if I have the privilege and honor, I will do the best I can for our residents. I will listen to our residents and our other council members. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh Yes. Well, if, like Eric said, if we have the privilege to be elected, first, first of all, I will listen to my uh, fellow council people. Before I speak, I will try to make a decision with them if the resident of the city agree about, agree on that. If there is an issue comes up or something, I will definitely go to the city resident. I want to see as many as, many as I can visit, to visit them to see what's their concern. And after, after that, maybe we come back when we discuss it with respect to each other and make a decision which will benefit the resident of the city and also the city itself. Thank you. Thank you. Sala? Well, my background is in bit, was in business uh, with for-profit and non-profit, so I know how to handle competing interests. I believe in mutual respect. It's got to be a two-way street. Um, I value every human being and every person I t uh, come in contact, I want to hear their point of view because they, even though they may have a different point of view, it may be one that might be worthwhile for the community. So you need to hear all the different uh, ideas that come up, weigh them, decide which one is beneficial, and discard the ones that are not. But the problem I see here is that I don't think we're giving our residents more voice. Uh, from some of the initiatives that have happened, we haven't had them contribute. I'll just use the parks and recreation. When I walked around, a lot of people said we wanted a pool. Why wasn't that even on there? I said, uh, that is, that's not something I can do. But the point is, you, w before you go out and decide, some of the attitude is, we've waited too long, we're going to do it all. But talk to the people. See what part of that project they want. It may not be necessarily all of it, or it may be something that you didn't place on there that they wanted. Why wasn't that given an option? Uh, I believe in getting as much feedback. With the technology nowadays, you can put something out there and get people to vote on what particular areas are they interested in, what is the most impressing, uh, impressing ideas or pressing issues for them. Let that be, because communication is essential. We don't know what you want until you speak and share with that with us. But I want to hear your voice. I want to be able to take that back to the council if I get the chance to work with them. But I believe 
through my communication skills that, uh, and through my respect for every one of them, though I may disagree, I have every opportunity to work with them well. So uh, disagreement is not as good because sometimes you need that in order to balance the ideas. The, it's the means of disagreement. It has to be professional and considerate. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, we're going to move on to the next question. And the first person to answer this question will be Michael Radke. In 2016, voters approved the city's recreating recreation proposal, which levied a new millage devoted to improving parks and adding amenities such as a new recreation center, splash park, skate park, and dog park. Some feel that the proposal fell short by not including a city pool in the new rec center, while others didn't appreciate the new tax. Do you feel the changes to city, city recreation were too expensive, just right, or should even more have been spent? <laughs> and why? <laughs> I always think we should spend the least amount of money possible to accomplish our goal. But at the same time, when you talk about recre recreating recreation, I support the proposal, but I came down very close to not supporting it. My father, who I live with, he chose not to support the proposal. He thought it was too expensive. And I can respect anyone who says that. To me, there was a couple issues with the proposal I didn't agree with. I didn't agree with the skate park. I think it's a waste of money. I thought there should be a pool in the proposal. If we're going to do it, let's do it all the way and correct. But to me, on the end of the day, I wanted to make sure that new residents, not just new residents, but all residents, had facilities that were worthwhile, that represent our city in a, a great light, and you know, encourage young families to really get out and meet their neighbors and do activities. So I support the proposal. I think it's going to help our city attract new residents. I think it's going to improve our downtown, our, our municipal area. I think it's going to give our uh, a skating park in the in the wintertime will be wonderful. I think it also will help us grow our farmers market. So I supported it, but I can respect anyone who thought it was too expensive or too much. Okay, thank you, Deanna. The first time that we wanted to um, build a recreational facility, the cost was just out of sight, and that included a pool. I love a pool. I would have loved to have pool this time, but it was just plain too expensive. We need to think about the future. This is something that we should have done years and years ago, but right now it seemed like it was the right opportunity. We had just come through a, uh, let's call it a, a downturn, and money is uh, a little cheaper, <clears throat> so we're getting more for the dollar. The idea behind this recreational program is it's not for us right now necessarily, but it's for our children of the future. Our children's children, my children are all grown, but my grandchildren are still of the age where they're going to enjoy all the benefits of this proposal. Yes, it is a millage increase, but that increase is not taking us up to what our taxes were years ago. I know I still have not reached my maximum that I was paying before, uh, what, back in 2006, 2005. So I think it's a good program. It's for the future. It's for future generations, and uh, the people support it. All right, thank you. We're moving on to Jasmine. I will have to start with a statement given by our city manager on the September 19th meeting. Uh, he was encouraging people to go to the Save My City town hall. He said the way the state funds its cities in Michigan isn't working. In Sterling Heights since 2000, we lost 45 million in reduced revenue sharing from the state that is on top of the 15 million plus that we lost on reduced property taxes values that we still haven't recovered from, from what they were in 2007. So we had a deficit there. We are not receiving that money, but we put a millage to get, raise our taxes. 
I was against the millage. I didn't think it was a great idea for the city because we could have done it in a different way. The residents, we lost by 725, around that amount of votes. Over 25,000 people voted against. It was a really close call. So it's the half of the city is telling you we don't need it. There were another half of the city that was misled to vote for something that they thought was good. When we went through the, the finances part of the proposal, I couldn't approve it. I will not say yes to something that will cost for the residents more tax increase, less money in their pocket. The projects could have been done in a better way. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Nicholas? I think this is actually one time that my youth works in my favor. I am just one year removed from using the Sterling Heights Parks and Recreation Program. I was a member of the baseball organization for, I believe, 12 years. So I have a little bit of experience with parks and recreation. Um, I personally am for upgrading, maintaining, and upkeeping parks and adding to our already great amenities. But I still don't think this went far enough. I agree that there should have been a pool. And in addition to that, I believe there should have been further renovations to some of our sport activities. Uh, the baseball fields at Delia Park could definitely use upgrades. There's not even roofs on the dugouts. There are days when it's over 100 degrees and kids are forced to sit outside because we can't afford a roof for a dugout. So I think there are a lot of upgrades that could have been done within this city. And frankly, I don't think it's going to cost that much money to just put a little wood roof on the top of a dugout. So. Okay, thank you very much. We'll swing back over here to Eric. Um, I do support some of the uh, recreating recreation, but I can say if I sat on city council at the time, I never would have voted all or nothing. Um, I think there's parts of it that are fantastic. I think there's other parts, uh, like a pool that would have cost t uh, taxpayers an exorbitant amount of money. The only position that I have now is the taxpayers voted it in. So I will work diligently to make sure that we're working with city council and city administration and our contractors to see how we can come in under budget, ahead of schedule, without interfering with quality, just like the 15 mile interceptor is done. They've come under schedule, under budget, and saved almost $6 million in interest on that project. We should take a lead from that. I think our parks are beautiful. If you go to my Facebook, I did videos that we have great parks to come to and see. It's important that we bring young families in. It's important that we take care of our seniors. It's important that this millage got passed but I'm not happy that everything was thrown in all, all or nothing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Haytham? Yes. Well, it was a proposal. It did pass. That means the resident of the city approved it, and they allowed it to pass. And adding a pool, yes, I love pool. I always, uh, matter of fact, I, we are with the sheriff department. We have to take a swimming test every year. So I love the pool. But... There is certain amount of money or uh, burden we could put on the resident. Maybe after we finish, you know, with the rest of the parks, and maybe we could uh, add some of the. We have surplus money in the, in the, you know, in the city fund. We will be able. We will be able to work on a pool without adding more taxes or putting, high, you know, heavier burden on the residents. And I am with that proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Sana? Well, I spoke up against all or nothing approach. I don't believe an all or nothing approach is a way to decide on, on a major investment of $45 million and a 20 year tax liability on the residents. They, uh, the current council, and I don't, I don't mean to attack them, but the current council said, we've waited long enough, we're going to do it all. That's not the way you approach business. You look at, first of all, what do the residents want? Why didn't you put it out there and let them vote on it? What issues are most important to them? And, and if everybody agrees or a great percentage of them agree, then move forward in that direction. Because the whole purpose of 
a community is to respond to those people and provide the amenities that they're seeking. Second, when it was put out to a vote, half, most of the people weren't aware. The only information they received is through a committee that had a lot of special interest money. A developer de placed $25,000 in that committee, and we had waste management, Rizzo money in there. Uh, or Rizzo money, I'm not sure about waste management. But my point is, they had a committee to send out literature. So they were only speaking one side of the issue. They didn't present the fact that people could have made a decision, phased this in, chose what is their priority, and then pick the ones that are needed and discard the ones that are wasteful. They weren't given that option. They were only given one option. And as a, you're not standing up yet. And as, and as a resident, I would like to hear all the options. And this is what I thought was very wrong because they didn't even consider that second option because they wanted to do it. And I think the people didn't because it was too close. And even with the literature, it was too close. We, no one else had any other uh, information. The information was owned by the council. That was theirs. It wasn't the people. The people were not fed all the information they needed to know. Thank you so very much. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. It always stands for you. Um, we had shared services. So talking about the pool, that's easy. That was expensive. There's a liability. And Warren has a great pool and a community center. So we worked with them. I'm glad that that worked out well. Uh, great recession meant that going back in time that we didn't have money to keep core services going at some points, you know, where we had people being laid off, we couldn't invest in parks. So we were running behind the eight ball. So when times were getting better, uh, did we want this, this process of beautifying the city to, to take a longer period than it needed to? No. Does the administration have to come up and make decisions that we feel are right for the residents? Yes. So we put a lot of information out. I think we put enough information out so the residents could understand why we're going down that path as we did with the safe streets millage uh, we try to position as a city to allow the residents to know all the facts that we can share with them and and i think that's a key point too is that we are elected officials appointed official we are elected officials <laughs> to, to represent the city right so that means that you know it's our job to work for the residents so we feel that we're doing the right job thank you Thank you, Gary. Maria? Could you repeat the question? Mm -hmm. Sure, no problem. In 2016, voters approved the recreating recreation proposal, which levied a new millage devoted to improving parks and adding amenities, such as a new rec center, splash park, skate park, and dog park. Some feel that the proposal fell short by not including a city pool in the new rec center, while others didn't appreciate the new tax. Do you feel the changes to city recreation were too expensive, just right, or should even more have been spent, and why? Well, Melanie, your question hit the nail on the head. The voters approved. Um, I think the city did the best job they could putting out the information of what was all in included in that ballot proposal. As far as a pool goes, I think we would all have loved a pool. But did we want to add another $10 million of debt to that project? I think what people need to understand is in that millage, we have allowed for the maintenance and the staff of those programs. Um, in, to include a pool would have substantially increased what that millage rate would have been. Um, the city did not put out any flyers or mail out any flyers that were one-sided. The city had nothing to do with that. I had nothing to do with that. Members of council had nothing to do with that. If a private committee or entity wants to put out information, they can. This is America. So um, I think for the people that were disappointed that there's a millage, talk to the people that voted it in. For the people that didn't vote at all, which was a significant number, they have to look at themselves and what part they played in that passing or, or if it didn't pass, what, what part they played in that as well. Thank you. I, thank you. Liz? Well, I, I also did vote for the millage. I have lived here, as I said, 25 years, and I have the grandbaby that I'm excited to bring to the splash pad. But also, it's not just about the kids. It is about seniors, and I'm 53 years old. I am knocking the door on seniorhood. In two years, I'm considered a senior citizen. 
So I'm looking forward to the rec center and all it can offer us more amenities. I am looking forward to getting a kayak and kayaking right across the street at Dodge Park. These are things that we now can use in our city. And so I think it went, it did, we did well to use what we had. We've got that river, cleaning it up meant a lot. And no, I, although a pool would be nice, as a nurse, knowing the liability, the expense, it wouldn't be worth it to us as a city. It would be, as, as Mr. Sholock said, maybe something we can add, and as has been suggested, these are things that we can add on later in different millages if you want another millage and have the voters decide on in another millage. But at this point, this is what this current millage and the voters decided on, and it is what the voters wanted. It included the art, it included the, all the amenities that are to improve. And so I thank the voters. It was a close vote, but as a per someone of personally losing mm -hmm. on a close vote, that's what it is. That's America. So thank you. All right, thank you, Liz. Barb? Well, I honestly was in favor of the parks um, millage. Um, they, I was from the beginning, but if the residents had voted it down, I certainly would have looked for a plan B, but we we're fortunate enough that we didn't have to. I feel that our city administration gave out enough information for residents to make a decision. Certainly in the planning stages, when a pool was presented to us, we found out we really didn't have the room for it. It wasn't just the cost. There was no room for it. And in making room for it, we would be giving up part of the building that you're going to see. So instead, the plan B for the pool was working with um, the city of Warren. They had an underutilized pool, and we they were at, you know we do this um, service sharing, so they were more than willing to share services with us and give our residents their resident rates so that they could use the pool. It's not maybe as easy to get to as it would be in our city, but certainly for the people that are using it, you know they enjoy it. Not only that, is the people that were paying the out of uh, resident rate in Warren realized that they were actually going to be saving money because of the reduction in their, in their usage cost. So I, I, don't, I, I have to disagree with when people say that the city didn't inform residents because we were criticized because we were at too many places. We were criticized because it was at Sterling Fest. We were criticized because we made the information available at the library. So I'm really struggling with the fact that people feel that the city, that um, feel that we as a city did not um, notify our residents about what was going to happen. Not only that is we were in a position to do this because we had the lowest debt per capita in any city, I think, in southeast Michigan. So we were in a position to assume more debt. So does it mean that we have to? No, but the residents wanted this. It was the time to do it, and we did it. And they, and I'm grateful that they passed it. Thanks, Barb. Nate? Uh, so I will try to be quick, because I'm going to first uh, uh, do my prepared statements on the issue and then try to address some of the criticisms in two minutes. Uh, so first of all, this will be, uh, with the new revenue, uh, the city is going to make investments in the city that we have not seen in decades. Uh, we're making innovative steps to attract and retain residents and business through a huge expansion and upgrade to our park system. Uh, this investment will include 120,000 square foot, foot rec center, a splash pad, revamping Dodge Park, and improvements to all of our neighborhood parks. So I am, uh, I am uh, and was and always have been in favor of this parks and rec millage, and I'm very excited for all the, the things that are going to be taking place. Uh, the first couple of things that I heard was that we didn't talk about it with the residents and ask them, you know, what it is that they would be interested in having, and that's uh, just not true. We had, I believe, three town hall meetings. Uh, a couple of them were well attended, and I think one of them was not very well attended. Um, we also had the info, info booth at Sterling Fest, where people, uh, residents could come up and talk about, you know, what they liked about the you know, the initial or the uh, the millage. Um, the other, the next thing that I want to talk about is this sort of all or nothing idea that it was, you know. We either do all of it or we're not going to do any of it. Or one, one uh, candidate suggested that we do little by little. So that, that begs the question, did we, do we want everything that's in the Parks and Rec Millage? Meaning, do we want the skate park? Do we want the ice rink? Do we want uh, to fix up the neighborhood parks? Or do we, do we want just some of the things? Well, if you just want to do uh, some of the things, I think that that's, uh, you know, that's 
not considering the fact that you may not use the skate park, you may not use the senior center, but there is a population out there that will, okay? Uh, the next thing is as far as, as economies of scale, had we decided that we wanna do all these things, but over a period of time, well, we start building something today, we start building something else in five years, we start building something else in 10 years, that's gonna have, a, the, the, the costs are gonna seriously increase because of the economies of scale. Doing it all at once will end up saving money if this is, in fact, all the amenities that we want to have in, in, in our city. The pool has already been addressed, uh, and I can guarantee that people will be using each and every one of these amenities uh, on a regular basis, so thank you. All right, thank you. So, thanks, Nate. I think I'm going to try to sneak in one more question before we do our wrap up. Okay. So, the person that will get the first opportunity to answer this one is Deanna Koski. <laughs> and the question is. The subject of frequent resident complaints concerns the changes made to Michigan law regarding consumer fireworks and the increased levels of noise that their use has brought to the city. What approach should the city take to alleviate the noise problem associated with fireworks? Send our own person to Lansing. <laughs> <laughs> we have uh, contacted our representatives in Lansing a number of times. We put forth many efforts uh, requesting that it be repealed. I know we're working with uh, one representative uh, very closely, uh, Mr. Yanis, uh, and he is leading me to believe that he is going to work very diligently to, if he can't get it repealed, that he will have it corrected. I know I have a dog at home and we have what I call our little pond in the backyard. And it's a favorite place for neighbors to go over the fence and down into the pond and then set off the fireworks. They're beautiful, but my poor dog is a, a rut for the next week. So I know I'm not the only one that is going through that. We have our veterans that do have issues with loud sounds like that. So it's not conducive to a good neighborhood. I would like to see it repealed. I would support all efforts by this council to send our letters, to make our contacts with our Lansing representatives. And that's all I know that we can do is to continue to work with them and try and convince them that they need to hear the voice of Sterling Heights. <coughs> Thank you, Deanna. Jasmine? I walk a lot, and when we had the holidays and people are using the fireworks, I wonder, I hear when I come to the meetings, the discussions that is to be repealed, but we had a situation or a problem. The residents are using it. What are they doing to repeal it, or what are they doing to stop using it? You will see streets that are filled out. I feel for the veterans. I feel for the people who those noises are causing stress. Um, we don't do it ourselves in our house. We watch everybody else doing it because it's expensive. And if everybody does it, <coughs> why do we have to go and buy? I think something has to be done, but the community had to be reached out. It's not just here in these walls that we discussed. It had to be repealed. It's out there where they are using it, where they are the one buying it, where the places that are selling it. We are not going to fix the problem making it illegal when the people are using it and love using it. So the community has a must be involved. We can't deny that they are using it and they enjoy using it. Something had to be done, but I also heard uh, Mr. Janes um, working it out in Lansing to be repealed. Why is not passing? Let the community get involved, and we will find out the reasons. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Douglas? Um, I'm going to agree. Uh, fireworks is definitely a hot topic in Sterling Heights, and uh, much like Councilwoman Koski said, uh, I also have a dog at home, um, and my 120 pound baby um, is definitely afraid of fireworks. So I, I entirely understand 
where this is coming from. I have also reached out to Councilman, uh, excuse me, to uh, Representative Yanez um, and expressed some of my concerns uh, as well as my mother has and I'm sure my dad is well on his way to it as well. So um, I just want to uh, make sure I can reach out to uh, anybody at the state level who'd be willing to work with me on uh, repealing or at least uh, replacing this act with something that is more conducive to the residents. However, I would first suggest conducting a study to find out exactly where it is the residents of the city stand on the issue because there are quite a few residents in the city of Sterling Heights who Hello. use fireworks and it's important that we abide by what our residents want in addition to what we believe is best for them. Thank you. Eric? On the fireworks issue, it's a hot button as I'm knocking doors every day for the last five months. Like a lot of other people I've run into, Liz, I've run into a bunch of times and a few other candidates here. Um, but I am a proponent that Sterling Heights City Council focuses on what's within their circle of influence. I believe that at times we can reach out of that circle of influence. I think if the residents, just like someone wants to use the skate park and someone wants to use the, um, the ice skating arena with the skate park, it's different residents. We have residents that love it. We have residents that hate it. I think there's no in between. And we have to find out what's best for our community. If our circle of influences is bringing the residents concern to our state legislators and getting them to work on it, we need to do our job and do that. But we can't always take our opinion and force it on to a situation that we have no control over. Our circle of influence is what we can handle on this council and we need to diligently work for that for our residents. And if it takes listening to the residents and bringing it and being that squeaky wheel, we need to do it. But there's two sides of the residents and I don't know where this issue is really gonna go. I hope it does get looked at. Uh, mm -hmm. The lanterns scare the heck out of me. They land on my, um, my shed every year and I'm afraid it's gonna go up. Uh, I know those are banned, but there's a lot of them out this year again, so I think we need to enforce what we already have on the books. We need to do a better job at that. And I know our firefighters and our police departments were doing their best to do that. Thank you. Thanks so much, Eric. Haytham? Yes, we all know this is a state decision, came from the governor himself. And city of Warren, they put limit when, or limited time, where can you shoot the firework? and for how many days. They only give the resident of their city three days from 7 to 10 o'clock p.m. I don't understand why we cannot do the same thing. And their police are given tickets to whoever violate this city ordinance. I know it came from the governor himself, but why we cannot all do something or think of sending letter to our legislation, to our representative, and ask them at least this rules or law has to be adjusted to where it's minimize, you know, minimize the days they can use firework. They start from June <laughs> and my little dog has spent the whole month under the couch. Uh -huh. You know, it's really annoying and I am against that, you know, state ordinance or uh, it's a, they made it a law now, I think. <laughs> So I don't know what else to do. I mean, we could write the governor, we could write our uh, representative, and I hope there's something we can do to either stop it or <clears throat> minimize it to three days only. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sana? Well, this is an issue that is definitely hot button. It's one that I don't participate in. I do view it though, because my neighbors all do it. And I get up the next morning and there's on my roof, on the ground, and I'm glad nothing was burned. It is a difficult situation because there is those who enjoy it and those who do not. I'm in the middle. I don't know what the people want. I understand the irritations, the, uh, the veterans that are being affected. Uh, I, I agree with uh, Haytham and uh, Eric that there might be a, a possibility of containing it. I think we have it for three days right now. But we are not curtailing it because I know there are people out there at one o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning, I can't sleep. They're violating it. Mm -hmm. So maybe by holding them accountable, you might reduce it. I, this is a big, it's a big city. It's a great number of people. I don't know what the solution is, but one that requires input from the residents 
and uh, c communication with the state to see if there could be some changes, maybe reduce the number of days you're allowed to do it. I don't know if you want to take it away from them entirely. I don't, I don't know if you can designate a certain area either. Uh, that is really a difficult one, but one that definitely should be looked into. Thank you. Gary? I don't like fireworks. But it's not about what I like. Uh, the governor wanted to expand the law. He wanted uh, those folks that were going out of state to be able to buy larger fireworks uh, to be able to buy them here. So it was a revenue generating decision. Uh, he made that for all of us. And I don't personally like it, but it's, again, it's not about me. I say enforce the laws that we have on the books. That's it. Thank you. Maria? Uh, thank you. Virtually, our hands are tied by the state law. Yeah. They take jurisdiction over anything that we want to do in our city. They dictate when it's allowed, which is the day before, the day of, and the day after holidays. Um, the police enforcement, um, what we did put into place were hours that they were allowed and specific sites that were, they were allowed to be shot off from. Um, as far as police enforcement, Unfortunately, the way the law works, the police officer has to actually see who is igniting that firework in order for a citation to be issued. That being said, being all over the city when there are hundreds of fireworks going off, um, some of which are concealed by backyards or wherever, it's virtually impossible to enforce. Um, so we have reached out to the governor's office. We've sent resolutions. We've reached out to um, Representative Ha, who introduced this bill. We have been talking to people at the state level, and um, it's in their hands. There, there really is nothing more we can do. We have been communicating with them all along in opposition of this. I too have a 65 pound hunting dog that puts herself in the bathtub. So I am well aware of how it affects dogs, cats and animals, but I really worry about our vets too, our veterans that, that are affected by all that noise as well. So thank you. Right, thanks so much, Liz. Well. Unlike Gary, I love fireworks. I go to them every year, but I don't like the noise, and I don't like that they disrupt our citizens, and I do understand that they do. But everyone does at this point have that right who wants to fire them off. So yes, we do need to pursue at our level what we can, which is influencing our state representatives, influencing even through just personal influence to the governor himself. That's what we have to do, and that's what we did as a council. We sent a resolution asking to have this looked at. At this point, that's all, all the ability that we have as a state acts, a state resolution, so that the city cannot supersede what the state allows. Warren tried it, they're not really, they were overturned because, because it was, a, a, you cannot supersede a state law. So with that, we want to keep push, putting the pressure on, and and hopefully it will be resolved, so that people are not disrupted as much as it is disrupting them now. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. Barb. Well, we tried. Well, first of all, this is all put into place for revenue. That was a way of bringing money into or capturing money that they thought residents of Michigan were putting into the pockets of the state of Ohio. Um, ironically. The same fireworks that people were going to Ohio to buy are illegal to use in Ohio. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's one thing. But they, you know, everybody thought that you know people from Michigan will stop going to Ohio, will make more money, um, there'll be a sales tax on them, we'll have so much control. But um, not really giving uh, too much consideration into the people that were listening to those fireworks. Right now, we're working diligently with our state representative Henry Yannis, who is a re a former uh, Sterling Heights firefighter mm -hmm. who has been uh, very active in trying to get some kind of either repeal or maybe some adjustments to the existing law. Um, some of the things that I would be in favor of if we can't have the uh, law repealed would be maybe a reduction in the days that you can do it. And I mean, not you might not be able to do anything with three days in a row, but less holidays. I don't think we need to use fireworks for Columbus Day. I'm, you know, those are days that I just don't think they need to be used. Um, or Thanksgiving. I mean, there, so it might be a reduction there. 
But I think the biggest thing is for us to um, work as a city and as a council to try to get more local control because I, I, I feel that this is just one issue where the state is taking away um, some of our responsibility and we have nothing, we can't do anything about it. So I would look for first local control and then maybe the elimination of some of the days that they're used. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Nate? Thank you. Uh, so here's the issue. Here's the problem. Um, there are nuisance for family, families with kids and, uh, and with dogs. Um, they are a, a problem for veterans, especially those with PTSD. Uh, they're so readily available that it makes it impossible, impossible for the police to enforce. Uh, I, I think that what should happen in the state of Michigan is that uh, I understand it's a revenue generator, uh, but I think that we should just forget it. We should ban the sale make it legal to use the grade of fireworks that you can buy now on say, 4th of July, New Year's Eve, and that's it. Um, and you know, make available the, the grade of fireworks that we were able to buy prior to the new law. Those were the ones that just sat on the ground and didn't go into the air, and, and, and then some of them were really neat. So I think that we could go back to that. Uh, you know, I don't want to punish people, because you, you're never gonna have people not shooting off fireworks on the 4th of July. And I think that on the 4th of July, it's appropriate to shoot off fireworks. So if we made it legal to use the type of grade uh, of fireworks on the 4th of July, but they, they're still gonna have to go to Ohio to buy them, because I don't think they should be able to buy them in Michigan at all. The, ready, the, the, <laughs> the, the, the ability for them to just go down to the corner store and buy these fireworks is why we hear them all summer long. And that's gotta end, so thank you. Thank you, Nate. Okay, Michael? Last but not least, right? Um, I don't think this issue is very difficult. I think that the current fireworks law does not work for Sterling Heights and does not work for a lot of older and fully grown communities in Michigan. It's one thing to be on my property up north near Frankfurt and launching fireworks off into the sky on the 4th of July. That's wonderful. It's another thing to be awoken in my home at 2.30 in the morning because one of my neighbors down the block decided to fire mortars. As a working person, I work on holidays often. I know that it can be startling to jump out of bed in the middle of the night because someone is violating the, the rules that are already set forward. Now, I'm the son of a veteran, too. And my dad goes to the VFW and talks to everyone. And for a lot of those guys, it's, it's very difficult for them to deal with earth shattering. I mean, my house rocks. My windows shake from some of these fireworks. I hear my neighbor's dogs barking because they're awoken, like myself, by these fireworks. So I think we have to have a better system. Is, is it you know, un, unchartered cities that could do it in, in places like Sterling Heights and Warren where people live very close together that they can't? Is it going back to the former regime where you had just certain things that were allowed and other things that were banned? I don't know what the solution is, but I know right now that when I'm woken up at 3.30 in the morning by my neighbor having a little bit of a long celebration, it's very frustrating to me. I'm sure it's very frustrating to my fellow residents of Sterling Heights. Well, thank you all for answering my questions today. I really appreciate it, and it was a wonderful job by all of you. We just have enough time now to wrap up by letting you each do your two-minute uh, summation, and I'm going to choose a name for who will go first. Maria Schmidt. Oh, I started and I'll finish. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I bet. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> During the past two years, our city has much to be proud of and excited about. With the continuing voter-approved Safe Streets millage, we've been able to invest over $19 million in our local neighborhood roads over the past four years. We've also been able to hire new police and fire personnel in anticipation of retirement so there is no gap in protection. The voter-approved recreating recreation is transforming Dodge Park and the neighborhood's into fun, healthy, and active destinations. The new community center across from Dodge Park will enhance the parks and recreation offerings to all the residents. From an indoor walking track, bas basketball, and pickleball courts to dance studios, there will be something for everyone. Sterling Heights continues to be one of the safest big cities in the nation. That being said, a direct reflection of all city employees and residents working together. It's how we make it work here. Because we've been fiscally responsible in our planning and spending, we're able to deposit money into our rainy day fund for the past four years. We also are one of the few communities that are making a dent in our underfunded retiree health care account. Sterling Heights continues to experience significant residential, manufacturing, and commercial growth while other neighboring communities are finding significant vacancies. 
That growth contributes to the reason why we have one of the lowest tax rates in Macomb County. This sitting, sitting city council is also fighting for every user of the mid water and sewer system. When we pay the county for a service of inspecting and maintaining the sewers, we expect the work to be done. Not to find out after a sinkhole swallows three homes and part of 15 mile road that the work was never done. We want those who violated our trust to be held accountable. In closing, I would like to thank the residents for giving me the opportunity to serve every one of you. My promise continues to be that I will work hard, be fiscally responsible, and educate myself to make a more informed, responsible decision with honesty, respect, and integrity. I will listen with an open mind and vote for what I believe is in the best interest of all the residents of Sterling Heights. Again, I thank you, and I ask you for your consideration when casting your ballot by mail or on November 7th. Okay, thank you very much, Maria Liz. Well, that was an excellent uh, Advertisement for Sterling Heights. So thank you, Maria. She <laughs> covered so many points. I, I want to thank you all for coming today, and thank you for the for the uh, Ma Melanie, excuse me, for being here to uh, ask us the questions. I want to just share a few things. Some of the voters do know who I am, some do not, but I want to share some of my top goals for this city, and those are to work to improve the quality of life for all citizens. As a nurse, quality of life is key. If we don't have a quality of life, it the highest measure possible, we do not want to be where we are. So I, I will promise to do that as your city council person and continue to do that by supporting strong and effective law enforcement through the fire and, um, and paramedic departments. I, I also, I pledge to keep and, uh, keep and guard us all by using your tax dollars wisely. We are true stewards of your money and we are as residents also making sure that what we do will also be in the best interest of all of you. I will always make sure that the citizens get the best bang for their buck. And then fi finally, I promise that we will continue to improve those roads that we've mentioned a few times. We do have that safe city millage and we are working diligently on them. Some of the roads that I drive on every day because I am a visiting nurse, I see how they are and I know that they are, they need, are in need of repair and we are working very diligently for that. And I will keep and maintain our city ordinances to make sure that we still live in the best and most beautiful city in Macomb County. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liz. Barb? In my 16 years of experience on the city council, I've witnessed firsthand the ups and downs of city government. Um, nine years ago, we watched the collapse of the banking industry, business, uh, close, businesses closing across the country, the value of our homes plummet in an unstable housing market, and tax revenue for the city declined. Um, <coughs> we projected that it would take 10 years before we could rebound, and here we are nine years later, and we're making it. But the city council and administration knew that we needed to establish a plan that would allow us to achieve fiscal responsibility and still can continue to provide excellent services. The residents, the city council and administration worked together um, to create a more cost effective government and moved us forward. It, it moving us forward involved all of us. As a community, we have succeeded. Um, during all the choices, whether it be at the council table or at the polls, the decisions were made that enabled us to remain a prominent city in the state of Michigan and across the country. But through all these you know, challenges, we still in, in, in experience population growth, remain one of the safest cities in the state and in the country, um, kept our, our bond rating at a double A, um, have low water rates. Um, so we have been, and we've attracted new businesses, new industry into the community. Um, my commitment to public safety was reinforced when residents passed the safe streets millage to not to hire retiring police officers and firefighters and also fix our streets. Um, I think that the uh, passage of the uh, recreating uh, recreation millage ensures us a vibrant community for all of us. But the city of Sterling Heights is our collective investment. Protecting our collective investment is a priority for me. I'm proud of our accomplishments, I'm proud of our workforce, and I'm proud of our residents who understand what it means to be a part of the solution. I'm asking you to vote for me because I've proven myself to be a leader who can work together with others and make the tough decisions in the best interests of all residents, in the best interest of our collective investment. Thank you to the chamber, and please vote by absentee ballot or on November the 7th. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barb. Nate? 
Well, thank you, Melanie. Thank you to everyone in the audience that came today. Uh, once again, thanks for everyone to uh, allowing me the opportunity to speak, to share my vision for our great city. I'm very proud to be a member of the Sterling Heights City Council. The city has a stellar, rep stellar reputation, and to retain this reputation, there are some areas I intend on focusing. I will continue to encourage business development as a generator of both tax revenue and jobs. I will work to make sure seniors are supported in ways that help them live safely in their homes for as long as they would like. We will continue to be one of the safest cities in Michigan by supporting the efforts of our police and fire departments. And finally, we will pursue opportunities that enhance and improve programs available to, to our residents, young and old. <clears throat> my experience as a father inspired me to get involved in public service. I believe in, the, in my two and a half years on the city council, I've made the most of my opportunities to make a positive impact on the residents of Sterling Heights. I will continue to dedicate myself to helping Sterling Heights remain a premier city that will attract and retain families seeking a great quality of life and a strong sense of community. On November 7th, I respectfully ask that you vote to re-elect Councilman Nate Shannon. You can get more information by finding me on Facebook at nateforcitycouncil.com. Thank you. Thanks, Nate. Okay, we'll move on to Michael. Thank you so much. I want to thank everyone for watching today and for coming here and listening to us. I think this is part of you know, your public duty to listen to us and hopefully make a decision for the best interest of the city. I think my plan for city council is very simple. I want to keep Sterling Heights safe. I want to hire more police officers and protect the fire department from cuts. I want better code enforcement. And I want to create a diverse city for everyone. I think everyone can find a place in Sterling Heights and should be welcomed here. Since 2008, we've laid off 200 municipal employees. I think we need to improve our city services. It's something that I really am focused on. You can learn more about my positions at my website, voteradkey.com, or maybe you'll see me in the neighborhoods. I've knocked on thousands of doors in the city so far, and if I haven't knocked on yours yet, I'll be coming to see you. The election is November 7th. Hope you might consider me. <coughs> Thank you so much for listening and watching today. Thank you very much, Michael. Deanna? Thank you, Melanie. The city is moving forward and has accomplished many goals in the last two years with the current city council leadership, which I am proud to be part of. With the approval of the Recreation in Initiative, we are reinvesting in the community for not only our youth, but all the residents to enjoy various improvements to our recreational services. The city is continuing the Vision 2030 initiative, including the Enhanced Shine program, neighborhood parks improved, <coughs> along with new funding to improve city roads. Roadway improvements will continue. The city's economic development plan for major commercial and manufacturing investments has continued business development growth and new business in the city. I support public safety. Our excellent police and fire department continues to improve their services to the residents. November 1, the fire department will begin EMS transport services, which are self-sustaining. The city created the Vision 2030 plan with input from the residents, which they wanted their city to be in 2030. I would like to serve the residents for another two years and follow the plan to keep Sterling Heights moving forward as a vibrant city that creates future leaders. I would appreciate your vote on November 7th. <coughs> Thank you so much, Deanna. Jasmine? In the last four years, from the podium, I have spent time and resources representing you, the resident, and learning how our city government works, researching the budget, and seeking how good stewardship of the city finances can be applied. I still have more to learn, but I will research it closely. With my experience, I can do it. My English may not be as fluent as the rest of the candidates, but I will continue to work on this to articulate my statements more clearly. Whether you are a Republican, Democrat, or independent, please get out and vote. We need to show our local government that we are tired of the way they are leading this city as we live in a more common city. We live in America that still has some freedoms that we cherish, freedoms to express our concerns, to carry our guns, to choose and not be forced to follow a liberal agenda. We need to stop the intimidation by people in government who feel 
that they had the power to harass the residents. We need accountability and real transparency from elected officials. We must give the city back to our resi residents and away from a special interest. <coughs> we need to fight for our residents that are here and we are struggling to pay our bills. We need to stimulate local employment by lowering taxes and asking for your vote so we can restore honesty and government. Let's start by replacing elected officials who promise you to save money with a tainted garbage contract or voted for a mass resettlement instead fighting against a lawsuit that shouldn't happen in the first place. Let us vote up, vote out officials who misinformed residents about the Recreating Recreation Initiative, which was an unnecessary tax increase. You and I can win. Let's take our city back. Can we beat them at the ballot box? Yes, we can. Please contact me at my Facebook page, Jasmine Early for the Sterling High City Council, or my web page where you can donate for my campaign, www.jasmineearlyforcouncil.us. Also, visit the page securemichigan.org. <coughs> You will see responses from from candidates there. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And now we're going to move on to Nicholas. All right. Uh, I want to thank everybody who came out once again, everybody who's watching back home, uh, and again to the Chamber of Commerce for putting this on. And once more, thank everybody who's up here today to discuss the future of our city, which is what we're really here to do today. I think it's fitting that we ended on a question about a state law because I actually have one issue that was only brought up by uh, Jasmine Early, um, when I'm elected, I plan to work hand in hand with state officials to ensure that small, local, family owned businesses like my family's own known as pizza or Screamers ice cream can have the same benefits and opportunities in tax abatements as big corporations in the city of Sterling Heights. You see, because I support equality, not just from person to person, but from business to business, family to family, and neighbor to neighbor. I will stand up for equality in the city of Sterling Heights. We are one of the most beautifully diverse cities in Michigan. We will embrace that, and regardless of what tears us apart, I hope that we can reach together and bridge that gap. So I want to be that voice for you guys I want to be the voice who speaks out against hate and against this discrimination. So, if you want any additional information, visit www.cavalliforcouncil.com. Visit me on Facebook. That's Nicholas A. Cavalli. And uh, hopefully, through today, I have earned your vote and your support. Come November, and hopefully in January, I'll be here representing you the way that you deserve to be represented. Thank you so much, Nicholas. All right, we're going to come back here to Eric. Oh, thank you. I'd like to thank every council member and every person that's running for council. I wish everybody the best of luck. Um, it's hard. I look in the audience of people that have run in the past, who have been elected in the past, and I have to thank every one of them for doing their civic duty. My father instilled one thing in me as I was growing up, and he said a public office is a public trust. <clears throat> So I ask you, can you trust, who can you trust to make the city government accountable to its residents? Put forward items that are in the scope of the city's responsibility and authority and who will make our city our dream city together. I hope from this debate, from visiting you door to door, from seeing you at fairs, open houses and festivals, that I have encouraged you to trust and support me. Together, we can make Sterling Heights our dream city. If you would like more information on my candidacy, please visit me at votecastilia.com or Castilia for City Council on my Facebook page. I thank you, the City Council, the Chamber, every board member. I want to God bless you, our great city, and our country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. Okay, Haytham, would you like to give your closing statement? Yes, please. Well, I would like to thank uh, the Chamber of Commerce. I would like to thank our audience. I would like to thank all the council people that they, who put many, many hours uh, trying, trying to, to be able to serve 
the city. And here's some of my beliefs on, a, on promises if I am elected. Uh, you have the right to speak, to worship freely, and to assemble peacefully. Uh, elected officials are working for you. Your government, primary responsibility is to protect you, your family, and your property. What you earn or build, it's yours to keep. I am Haytham Cholag. Uh, you can visit me on uh, my website, www.haythamcholag.com. And I am asking you <coughs> for your consideration on November 7th. Vote with your conscience. Vote for the right person to serve the city. And I thank you all for being here. Thank you so much. Sana? Well, I wish to thank you, Melanie, and the Sterling Heights Chamber for giving us this platform to share our motivation to run for Sterling Heights City Council. I am beholden to you, the residents, not to the and, uh, and to the best interests of our city, uh, city, not special interests. I'm going to try to finish what I didn't last time. My years of experience in insurance, investment, human resources, accounting, nonprofit management, along with my commitment to serve will be a benefit to our community and its growth. I have no personal agendas. I seek to trustfully, and I'm, I'm going to use that word again, trustfully represent the people of Sterling Heights. Um, mm -mm. And I also wish to offer sensible spending practices in a transparent and honest government. For I love the city and I wish for it to stay a great place to raise a family, work and play. Now, Vanderpool. There's a meeting after today. He spoke, we all need to be there. It's an important meeting because it's about the upcoming challenges that our city is gonna face. You, uh, you know, we're putting on this pretty face and we do have it, but we have to look at also the guts of the city. And we have quite a number of unfunded liabilities, quite a number. We have close to $166 million in unfunded pensions. Uh, and this is a real problem. I just want to share with you, there are neighbors to our north and east who are 100% funded. Troy, Rochester Hills, Pontiac even, and Livonia are 100% funded for their pension program. We are not, we're a shortfall. Where do you think that money is gonna come from, people? It's important. And I wonder if, we're, uh, since we have that shortfall, why we spend so much on the parks and recreation 20-year millage, and on the, fi the EMS, Emergency Medical S Services Transport. Boy, you get me all the time. Uh, this is important stuff. We are redirecting our money into things that are not necessary because that EMS, medical transport, didn't cost us a thing with Universal. We took it from here and put it under our city budget. That is a cost to us. So I just want you to know there are real issues here. There are things that we're going to have to approach. As much as I love the improvements, some of it didn't need to happen. We need to work on the guts of this, and this is unfunded liabilities. So okay. please, vote for Did you stand up? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Vote for Senator Elias this November 7th. If you want a change. On this council, you need to get out there and vote. I need your help. SenateElias.com. All right, thank you so much. <laughs> Gary, we'll move to you for the last wrap up. Perfect segue. Um, does the city resident, do the city residents want to change? We've got 85,000 registered voters. I think the average voter turnout for a city election like this is under 15,000. So that tells me that many of the residents like what's going on. If they didn't, they'd be at the polls. So if you don't want to change, keep the current council that's here, including me. I think I've earned the right to sit here. So what's the city done recently? I think we're in the, the best place since we've been since the Great Recession. People forget how difficult those decisions were. This, the current council, that what they had to face to be able to get us where we're at today. We are growing. We are investing in ourselves. Recreating recreation is, was put in place because we know that we've got an aging population and we need to be able to bring in young, bright, articulate families into this community. Diversity is always an issue. It comes up in several of our council meetings. We want to be inclusive. I think that 
the reason we're going to become the third largest city is because of diversity, because we're bringing in uh, ethnic groups that choose to live in Sterling Heights. Um, but what's left to do? So we had a SAW grant that came across, that's coming across, right? We've got 19,000 miles, I think it's 19,000 miles of uh, infrastructure. We've got a map. We're gonna find issues there. So how do we address those is important. Making sure that our DPW is staffed and funded to be able to address uh, infrastructure issues. I think the, the total number is two trillion across the US. Uh, it's not, that's not just us, that's going to be every community in the country. We have to be able to, to address that. Innovate Mound, uh, Mound is crumbling. It's what many of our roads are. We're working aggressively to make sure that we can be the kind of city that businesses want to be in. Not just the large businesses, not just the businesses that are in the innovation district that do make sure that we keep our taxes low, but as mentioned before, the small businesses, the SMBs that need to feel that we're supporting them, I've done that my entire career. I've owned one, and in the last 20 years, I've supported them. I know how to make sure that they uh, continue to grow, and I'll be there for them. On a volunteer standpoint, uh, I do a lot. I'm looking over. Uh, I think that the volunteer work I've done has proven that uh, I should be a res the person that you elect in November. So thank you. Thank you so much, Gary, and thank you all for being here today and giving us such a big chunk of your time today. It, uh, was, it took a lot to get through all 12 of you, but it was really important uh, discussion, and I think it's really going to help give our voters and our residents a, a much better idea of where you all stand on certain issues and just a chance to get to know you a little bit better. So I want to thank you all. Um, also wanted to end by thanking Bridget Kozlowski in the Community Relations Department here at the city, um, Dan Rizik and Bob Surgott um, and the staff of Sterling Heights TV for their assistance with the forum and being here today to tape these programs for Sterling Heights viewers and for airing them at future dates for people that couldn't be with us here in person. Our chamber thanks you, your fellow citizens thank you, and we wish all of the candidates that are here with us today success in the upcoming election. Please don't forget to vote on November 7th. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.